that. Oh, thermal camo, that would fucking suck. <laughs> Grant them so cool. Hey guys, Kick Rip here. Today, we're gonna be looking at some super cool futuristic kit. Well, not so futuristic as it's really a decade old at this point, but the US military has been trying to make all of our Star Wars and Halo sci-fi wet dreams come true for some time now. The dawn of the digital age raised a lot of questions for humanity, and the US military tried answering those sooner rather than later. High-tech integration into the battle space has been a centerpiece within science fiction, and the military is working to make it a reality. So starting with the Land Warrior program in 1989, the military was trying to integrate this new high-tech into the standard infantryman's kit. The aim was to create soldier computers, to turn each soldier into a sensor that is able to communicate and command and control at the individual level. They wanted to utilize the new LED display technology that Nintendo was using at the time, gamer, to send GPS and other valuable information directly to each soldier, essentially plugging them into the matrix. The heads-up display, or HUD, is a staple of these programs as it was designed to allow the soldier to not only fire from behind cover, but also to view valuable information without having to pull out a separate device, thus keeping their heads up, heads-up display, and maintaining situational awareness. It's just like the HUD that you have in a video game where you're able to view everything that you need to view without actually being in there and experiencing it yourself. Instead of pulling out a physical map, we have the mini map. And in some games with a compass that just stays at the top of your screen at all times, all very helpful, not just in a video game, but in the real world. A lot of this high tech was designed with the intention of enhancing the individual fighter's performance, but it doesn't always have that intended effect. The Land Warrior program would then spin off into the Future Force Warrior and the Net Warrior programs, all of which with the same goal of integrating commercial technology and computers into the infantryman's gear. But all of them really ended the same. We didn't see much actually get adopted from any of these programs, but we did get the cry combat uniform, so I call that a win. But the most high-tech integration that we have seen in the battle space presently is something along the lines of a Samsung Galaxy strapped to soldiers' chests. But the US military is not giving up hope. Even today, we see the new IVAS, or Integrated Visual Augmentation System, which uses Microsoft's HoloLens being tested. Kind of looks like a VR headset, right? gamer. So obviously the army has not dropped this concept of turning every soldier into a clone trooper. They are hard at work at using our tax dollars to make some of the coolest goddamn stuff imaginable. 
Now, enough about the background. Let's actually look at the heads-up display system that I have going on here. But before we go any further, I do want to thank the sponsor of this video, which is Venture Surplus. Venture Surplus was actually kind enough to hook me up with this replica Eagle RLCS map pack. It's super cool. This is a real Eagle RV, and the color matching is actually really good. Super handy, and there's a lot of different ways that you can use it. It really puts the modular and modular assault pack. Venture also has the whole line of Task Force stuff on their website, so you can get all the really cool Ranger Green, RLCS, Eagle Repro stuff, stuff that's made here in America, which is really cool. Venture Surplus also gave us a discount code, so make sure you use discount code KITCREEP at checkout for 10% off your entire order. I also want to thank Zulu24 and Zulu Outdoor for allowing me to use their field to film this video and get some of the cool shots that we have. So huge thank you to them. So this is the BAE Oasis Red Eye or Remote Eye Display Imager. It's a heads-up display that BAE Systems got a contract for over a decade ago. It's small, it's lightweight, it clips onto your iPro or it mounts to your helmet. Its purpose is to plug directly into your TWS or thermal weapon sight. Its sole purpose is to display the image of your weapon's optic without needing to get behind your rifle. So the coolest part is really that you can actually see through it. By removing this little cap in the front, you have a true heads-up display, just like in a video game. However, due to the limited technology all the way back in 2011, it's almost impossible to see the image in broad daylight. So you're going to need this little day cap if you're operating out in the sandbox. Uh, it's also not holographic, so you can, as you can see uh, now, as well as in the intro, uh, you can see that image from the front. It certainly is something that could give away your position uh, if someone else you don't want to see was using night vision or even with just their naked eye, depending on the brightness that you have this set to. Now, this seems super high tech, but at the end of the day, it's really just an analog video display. You can really display just about anything as long as it uses an RCA or BNC cable. Speaking of the cable, we're all thinking the same thing. This looks like a nightmare. And yes, yes it is. Uh, this gives a whole new meaning to your weapon becoming an extension of yourself because your gun is now literally connected to your face. Well, connected to a battery pack that is then connected to your face. Speaking of the battery pack, let's take a little look at this. Uh, so this here is one of two battery packs that this comes with. This is the AA model. This uses two AA batteries. And we have another one that uses CR123 batteries. And they're distinguished by color. CR123 is black and the AA one is tan. So this also is very simple. It's not very high tech. It's just two buttons and then a battery case. And we have two ports, one to connect to the TWS and one to connect to the actual red eye. So we only have two buttons on here by holding down the little sun icon that we have that is going to power it on. And then of course the little sun is going to increase the brightness and the little moon shape here is going to decrease the brightness. It's very simple, very straightforward. And that is a common theme that we are going to see with this system is simplicity. And then we have the other cable running down into the TWS. So let's talk about our thermal weapon site that we have here. As you can see, the actual red eye itself isn't very high tech. The battery box is very simplistic. And that's because the heart and soul of this system is the BAE systems UTM or universal thermal monocular. This was referred to by the manufacturer as being the world's first palm-sized thermal monocular available at the time. And I understand that today we have much smaller, much more advanced thermal monoculars, but think about what else was around at that time. Think about what came before this. Yeah, compared to those utter monstrosities, this thing is minuscule. You could practically head mount it. And well, you actually can because on the bottom here, we do have a standard camera mount screw and you can put a little j-arm on there i've tried it and yeah it's heavy but uh it's definitely doable more doable than with a paz 13. and what's really crazy is that had this thing come out just a few years earlier i believe that this is what would have been featured in call of duty modern warfare 2 all the way back in 2009. in that game the thermal weapon site was actually a pvs 14 larping as a thermal site and uh 
Notice how they did that instead of using a PAS 13, which was around at that time. It would have taken up your entire screen. Here we have the UTM and then the UTM X. This is the more advanced later model. And there's really not a huge difference between these two. Uh, the biggest identifier is going to be the ocular lens has a much different drum. If you want to see a separate video where we compare these two to each other, go ahead and leave a comment. Let us know if that's something that you're interested in. <laughs> but the long and short of it is the UTM is a three-in-one solution. It's a standalone weapon sight, clip-on capable thermal for use in front of a day optic, as well as a handheld scanner that altogether weighs in at just about a pound. Not to mention it also features two independently zeroable lasers, both IR and red visible. Now what's special about the UTM is at SHOT Show 2011, they described it as having gamer controls. Gamer! That means that it has an intuitive keypad with hotkeys. So although there are a lot of settings and functions with very few buttons, the controls are very straightforward and I found that it's pretty easy to operate with some practice. And then at the back here we have a video output port for use with the red eye of course, as well as for video recorders. This way you can post all of your super cool videos of you slaying hogs on Instagram. We then also have another port which allows you to plug in any standard crane style connectors so that you can operate the onboard lasers with a tape switch. We also have a push button up top for activating the lasers much like on a PEC-2 or a PEC-15. Much like any night vision device, this thing has a front objective lens that you can focus. But what's special about these is that the ocular lens also works as a parallax adjustment. So when you do actually use it in clip-on mode, it is going to allow you to adjust the parallax for your scope and make sure that you have very minimal impact shift. And these things are guaranteed to have sub MOA impact shift from the factory, which is really, really awesome. Speaking of clip-on mode, this thing does use a Wilcox flip to side mount. Here we can see it has that dovetail shoe on the bottom here, and that very easily indexes into the flip to side mount. So what this allows you to do is you can then use your day optic in tandem with it. And because it is a super good clip-on thermal device, but let's say you don't want to use it anymore. Or if let's say it dies, which is very possible, you can then flip it out of the way of your day optic and get back behind it, which I think is so super awesome. It allows you to have both thermal for reading heat signatures and very quickly switch to a normal day optic for seeing detail and getting PID. It then flips back very easily under some force to overcome tension whatever you want to call it. And lastly, at the butt here, we do have a little switch that is going to allow you to turn the lasers on or off. And you can turn on just the IR or just the red visible. Uh, the UTM-X is a little bit different. It has some different modes on it, but we'll talk about that in another video. Runtime is heavily dependent on ambient temperature conditions. So in cold weather, this thing is gonna die a lot and very quickly. But an external battery can be plugged in to where you run this video output port uh, for longevity in cold weather conditions. The biggest issue with the UTM is that when the battery dies, not if, but when, uh, you have now lost both your nighttime capable optic and your IR invisible laser aiming solutions at the same time. You can't just switch to your laser because your thermal weapon sight died. They are the same unit. So of course you're gonna to wanna to have a secondary sighting solution. And that means if you have a magnified day optic behind your UTM, you can't really passively aim with that super well. Uh, even with an LPVO, it's not easy. So you're gonna need something like a secondary red dot. And the biggest issue is that if you are a right-hander, you can see in the intro, I had this little hollow sun red dot mounted to the right side of this. The biggest issue with the UTM is that most of the mass of it hangs off to the right side. And what that does is if you have a 45 degree canted red dot on the right side as a righty, then it's going to be blocking your red dot and it's unusable. And then if I flip it out of the way, well now it's even more in the way of the red dot, even though now it's out of the way of the day optic. So a red dot would have to be mounted either to the left side 
and you'd have to, as a righty, do some really wonky stuff here. Uh, or for lefties, you can just jump in down with glee because something's finally made for you. Um, or you have to mount it to the top. And here I finally got my hands on a uh, Arms Inc. number 22 TRR and TRC. So I am a happy boy. And of course, as a standalone weapon site, it certainly works. It does have a digital reticle that you can use. Uh, the biggest issue is, again, the battery life. If this is gonna be the only electronic optic that you have on your weapon, then you better have a good set of backup iron sights that you can switch to, because I don't think they sell enough batteries at CVS to sustain this thing's hunger. All in all, the idea that you can clear a building from the hip and shoot around corners is really cool, but it's really not super practical. Even if you aren't exposing yourself as you maneuver through the fatal funnel, you better hope that those walls aren't soft. So for CQB, you're gonna to wanna to stick to conventional methods. So with time, the novelty does begin to fade. Its weight and size really is not an issue, especially when compared to something like the IVAS. That thing is absolutely massive. However, the convenience of firing without needing to shoulder your rifle is quickly undermined by the fact that you've now lost multiple points of contact. Whereas if you fire from the shoulder, we have about four points of contact. And when you fire from the hip, it's really, only about like two or three. And recoil management in real life is not like Rambo. Uh, it is much more advantageous to fire a weapon from the shoulder rapidly. But the biggest issue is exactly what you're thinking, and it is going to be this incredible snag hazard that is just waiting to just get wrapped around every single possible thing. There's not a single infantryman watching this video right now that's thinking, oh man, gee, I sure wish I had a bunch of random wires dangling off of me. No, it's just, it's not super practical. The newer systems like the IVAS are actually wireless, which is really great, uh, but I'm sure that we'll find that that's gonna have its own problems. With the return of trench warfare style fighting in modern conflicts that we see today, I do see a use for these kinds of remote viewing devices. We see a lot of high tech being integrated into modern conflicts out of sheer necessity and availability. We also see a lot of commercial drone usage. Most notably, we see drone users integrating FPV goggles to pilot their high-speed kamikaze explosive drones. These commercial technology solutions that are being integrated and adapted into combat roles is exactly what the US military has been trying to do since 1989. It's really interesting to see how these kinds of high tech are finding their place organically on the modern battlefield. Owning something like this is an incredible way to get just a taste of these sci-fi technologies that are being R&D'd right now. I am excited and horrified to see what they think of next. And all the while, I'll be here, waiting, playing with whatever cool toys they don't want anymore. So thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.